Hello, everyone. Today we have Dr. Jeff Hansen, and he's going to talk about formulation as a new production swine nutritionist. How are you, Jeff? I'm great. Thanks, Marcio. Yeah, appreciate our time coming coming to the show again. And uh, the first thing, Jeff, why why this topic? Why should we care about this topic? Well, the uh, when as we talked, the thing I like to do is help people understand. I spent 20 years uh, doing the production nutritionist role for Murphy Farms, Murphy Brown, Smithfield, and. I think it's important for people to kind of have a bearing about what they might be expected to do when they look at a role and then really how the, so describing that, but then also what's the historical context? How do you use your ed education? You know, what kind of uh, resources might you look forward to using? Um, how, how will you think, you know, how should you think about problems? Different things like that. That's why I think it's important to discuss that. Very cool. And uh, and I mean, yeah. So I mean, when we get out of grad school, it, it's not like there's a step by step program. So that that's that's great. So day one in the job, what should we do? Yeah. So the the first day is is always really interesting. But you know, as I as I transitioned, I went to NC State for a couple of years. So I had a little bit of flavor working with producers, but uh, starting with uh, Murphy Farms, you know, the first task was to establish some sort of formulation method. Of course, in many cases, that's already set up. Um, but if you're a new person going to a company that's never had a nutritionist, you know, you're going to have to establish your formulation matrix and pick a formulation package, and you know, your role is going to be to help. Uh, the procurement team, and this is an important topic, your job is to help the procurement team oftentimes um, determine what they should purchase to make feed for animals. Um, it is a huge responsibility, but you're in a support role. And so that's a, that's a key thing when you think of developing your formulation software. That's just a single decision. Right. And that's really the easy part. How you establish what ingredients to buy, what you what you test for. You know, there's purchasing contracts that have specifications. That'll oftentimes be coupled with a QA program. So it's not just, hey, I need to formulate this feed and I'm done. That's not the role of the nutritionist in a production company. It is your nutrition program and you should feel personally responsible for every aspect of uh, formulation, purchasing, uh, feed milling all the way to execution in the production environment. That includes feed transportation and milling and all of those aspects. You should feel personally responsible for every one of those aspects and you should endeavor to ultimately touch each one of those and make sure they're being executed perfectly. So I learned that over 20 years. Um, I didn't learn that in year one and so it is a tremendous task if you're walking into a new organization. Uh, plus, in addition to that, by the way, you're gonna be the, uh, in many cases, the, the research specialist as well, or the advisor with the veterinarians uh, to the production operation. So it's a multitask uh, or multifaceted role in most cases. Very nice. That makes total sense, Jeff. And all right, so as we think about it, eh, I got I got the the softer right, and then what's next, right? Uh, and one question I have to you is, where is the baseline, right? Is NRC the baseline, and then after that you're gonna use what chemistry or whatever? What's what's where do we start from that standpoint? Yeah, so that's that's a, absolutely the the right question to ask, right? You you come out and everybody's been taught NRC, and and then you <laughs> buy corn that's like eighteen percent moisture. And there's no 18% moisture corn. We thought it was 12%. Yeah, yeah. And, and there isn't anything, you know, the entire East Coast trades on a 15-5 corn basis. And you're going, well, that's not what's in there. And so it is important for you to start to realize this nutrient matrix that you have. NRC is a fantastic point to start, but it's right. completely wrong because <laughs> at a minimum, moisture is wrong on your corn. And 
and you need to reconcile in the NRC that those they, they did a wonderful job of establishing those on a standardized moisture basis. And so many students really don't realize that that's what it's based on. Um, they'll standardize back requirements to that type of a basis. Ideally, we would follow much like the dairy NRC or the beef NRC or even the horse NRC in that we'd go to dry mat. Um, mm -hmm. That would solve a lot of our problems, but uh, but we don't. We're swine nutritionists, us and chicken guys, and you know turkey nutritionists. We don't deal with that in a in a, an effective way. But you do have to realize that moisture is a bigger issue than what you were trained to believe, and that you have to reconcile past that on formulation and nutrient matrix. And so I do recommend, depending on your organization. Um, establishing your nutrient profiles um, using a wet chemistry method and establish your base matrix. Go back to a dry matter basis and, and, and do all your analyses and, and uh, do those on a dry matter basis. And then you can adjust your moisture and factor everything to moisture in that, in that product. Um, probably the, and, and I'm, not, I'm not a hater of NIR. I love mm -hmm. NIR. Mm -hmm. can never be better than the underlying wet chemistry, though, except mm -hmm. for probably um, there are some things like IV, iodine value of a product. It's actually a great tool for that. It can be better than uh, some of the wet chemistry metrics. But interesting. Most of our amino acids and things like that, I think, are, are interestingly adequate amino acids, uh, minerals. Um, you know, I was fortunate when we... When I first started at Murphy Farms, the best investment I think I ever made was a bomb calorimeter. Mm. And that is, it, it, without a doubt, the, the single best investment because right. we don't start with EE or ME or NE. We start with gross energy. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where you, you have many products that you don't know the origin. Uh, it may be a blend cookie meal, as an example, from a particular set of plants that may. It may only use, you know, apple pies from uh, McDonald's or whoever the base manufacturer is of, of those products. They have a product stream, and a lot of times you'll receive that, and it will be that product stream, and it'll be unique. And so, being able to establish that, and I, I always used, uh, I would, I always kind of went back to, you know, forming a statistic. You needed at least seven samples. So I'd request from vendors seven samples representing different production runs or production days. Mm. And in doing that, we could run our chemical analyses and establish a mean and standard deviation for that product uh, to go into our formulation matrix, just to give us some perspective. And then you would do that analysis over time and, and you would figure out what is uh, that mean. And then, you know, we will. I have something to talk about on stochastics, but variance is important, and how you set your matrix is really important. Not all products are created the same, and so I do want to touch on that a little later. Yeah, no, one, one uh, that's that's great. Uh, one comment on on my share still is, you know, if you're wrong by one or two percent in my share, that means that you're probably wrong by one or two percent on your uh, feed efficiency. Right, if you're if you're messing that up because of uh, it's a one two percent that you are not accounting for, that when you do our caloric right. efficiency, it's it's going to be uh, wrong. It is, and and it is, uh, it, it's a huge issue for mash feed in particular. You always saw, and, and you know, people that feed mash feed, they'll see these wild swings in feed conversion throughout the year corresponding to when they start harvesting corn. And uh, if you don't dry it down to a standardized moisture, then it, you should expect it to vary according to that. And so I think, uh, you know, I've got uh, friends that wanted to call me out on the article. I wrote the feedstuffs on that. But the fact is that people just need to recognize corn moisture is real. Mm. Wheat's not a big issue because we harvest it in the middle of summer. It's dry. I mean, there's very little wet wheat harvested in the United States, at least, or probably Canada, uh, maybe some in Canada. But certainly moisture is your biggest one that I think people underestimate in pigs. 
um, I don't think they underestimated another species. How about uh, digestible amino acids there, Jeff? Yeah, so as we go back through the history, um, the advancement of, of major advancements is digestible amino acid formulation. And, and I was at Texas A&M when Daryl Knabe and, and uh, uh, T.D. Tanksley really started uh, pushing that. Teresa Zabraska from Poland, you know, they brought the technique for doing the cannulations and brought it over here and started doing a lot of that work. And it's just, you know, it's transformative. Um, and some of the early work, it wasn't perfect, of course, but like so many things, it's always small increment. It's, I, I kind of think of it as a tree. You might go, you know, you might go like this, but you're still making advance. But if we could go from here to here, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Very few times we can get to do it. But uh, I think establishing the digestibility of the products is key and categorizing products, dr ring dried blood meal versus spray dried blood meal. Those have different digestibilities. Try to acknowledge those differences and take those into account, I think is a very important aspect in, in the digestible formulation. And then I, I also listed, because the next step is ideal protein. Mm -hmm. And so I was coming through college uh, or, or my doctorate program when ideal protein really hit, you know, the, hit us. Wang and Fuller, and then Dave Baker. I'm pretty sure Dave just randomly pulled these numbers out of the air, mm -hmm. but he's such a smart guy, they were probably right. Mm -hmm. um, but Dave, uh, Dave did a fantastic job. And, and ideal protein is such an important concept um, that you know we're, we're formulating on truly an ideal protein as we get more and more uh, synthetic amino acids, that becomes more relevant. So you're ratioing them to each other typically or uh, in history, it was factoring, but ratioing is a better technique. Very good. And then uh, I know you want to talk about toxins and, and anti-nutrition anti factors as well. And really, that's just in the consideration of the products that you buy. And as a part of the specification, um, that you know, I know uh, some friends of mine in Mexico formulated with toxin levels in mind. Um, and so there's different ways you can account for that. We finally got some good effective tools for vomitoxin that we didn't have that many years ago or weren't aware of. Um, and so, you know, you'd try to mitigate uh, some of those by, by formulating to a, you know, not to exceed level, but how that relates as your role in the specifications for purchasing. We used to buy, um, they called it chicken corn, all the vomit toxin we had in, I think it was uh, 2009, 2010, was just horrible. And we had to put an up, upper limit on the purchases of, of uh, corn and wheat. We bought some wheat from, that was theoretically free of vomit toxin, and mm. uh, it was not, it, was, it had two parts. And so it was a real issue trying to formulate with that stuff. But you have an important role to play. You don't have to create the solution, mm -hmm. but you need to be involved, particularly in a QA perspective and, and helping define, well, what are we going to do about these? And there are options more today. So toxins and anti-nutritional factors are important. Feeding raw soybean flakes is not a good thing. Um, you need to be aware of those things. But there's not that many. Just uh, always be careful that we don't know what we don't know, right? Yes. We'll, we'll learn some new things. Would you, in that case, uh, from the mycotoxin side, uh, would you try to sometimes segregate to a meaning finishing versus cell farms and those things? That's a great point. And we did uh, down here, you know, we're, uh, North Carolina was never fantastic at corn production. We had really small farms, so you could really never string together enough acres to be a professional corn grower. Today, that's not true, but in history, that was absolutely a problem. And we had aflatoxin and we had fumonacin. We still have fumonacin issues, uh, some, some vomitoxin. But you would, uh, for local corn, we would purchase that. And oftentimes, if it's high in aflatoxin, we had test it. And the really high ones, we'd put in a bin and it would only go to late finishing. Mm -hmm. And we'd try and keep cleaner, clean corn for our sows. And we realized there was a shortcoming of, of the tests. Um, we never took large enough samples and big enough tests, no doubt. But 
But what we found was that you had to buy the grain. Um, if you didn't buy that grain, if you rejected it, that farmer would never come back to you. And so we learned um, the hard way that you really do have to buy that. If you're going to be the dealer for that uh, farmer in his area, an elevator, you got to take his product. And so we got better at, at uh, segregating and investing in tests. And, and uh, it is an important aspect um, to be able to differentiate those products and manage your risk separately. And I'd like to say that the sows are the ones we always try to avoid. Uh, the animals you own the longest are the ones you want to, to put the least risky things into. Mm -hmm. so if you're going to do it, do it late finishing when that animal's going to be gone pretty quickly, uh, it's the lowest risk kind of endeavor. It's an animal you've invested a lot into, but honestly, um, it's yeah. probably have to eat through the, the shortest amount of time. So. They can't handle quite a bit. I don't know if they can handle it, but it's just from a risk mitigation. It is right. the animal that's going to own the shortest amount of time. So if there's liver damage, if there's long-term effects, you don't have to live with them quite as long. Right, right. Now you're going to own for a couple of years. Right, 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 right. That makes sense. Um, all right. How about energy? Yeah. So energy, you know, I mean, obviously that's the first most important thing. A host of your, uh, your guests have always talked about, you know, energy and John patience, I think is one that's a huge proponent. It is the biggest part of your diet. 85 plus percent of your feed cost is just energy whether that's for maintaining the animal or growing the animal. Um, you know, and as you think about energy, that's the, probably the hardest thing to reconcile. So, you know, as you know, I'm very passionate about energy and the theories of, of uh, how animals utilize energy. Do they eat to grow? Do they grow to eat? You know, what is, whatever that is. And why it's important are, these are really important thoughts because it influences how you decide to formulate and mm -hmm. how you decide to come to uh, a conclusion about how you select your energy density. So the first obvious problem, you come out of university, you're like, okay, I'm going to formulate a diet. I'm going to use corn and soy because that's, you know, in Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, that's what we grow was, you know, corn and soy. Um, and I get down to the Southeast and there's this thing called fat. And uh, it's a tremendous uh, value in some regions. And uh, so it was a really a, a learning lesson for me when I came down here, how do you decide on an energy level? Well, the NRC says, well, the NRC just reported an energy um, and they do go through some pretty elaborate steps and it's gotten better over time to define how energy gets consumed. And so energy, um, is so important first and foremost you ought to make sure you buy a bomb calorimeter or clearly understand a starting point because establishing that takes care of a lot of variance i've looked at a lot of trials and if they would have actually just measured the gross energy and the moisture of the corn that would have explained a lot of the variance that has been seen so uh, then you come back to um Picking your energy level. Well, in the Southeast, we have a lot of fat. And in the U.S., we have a lot of fat that's available to be fed. It was very reasonably priced. You know, ratios in the two to one ratio, um, very, very common uh, that I had seen in my early years. Um, we have a lot of restaurant grease that's available where there's populated areas on the East Coast, where there's uh, processing facilities. You know, we just have an abundance of fat, and it was valuable. And so uh, it was, and we had expensive corn because North Carolina, as an example, you know, imports two-thirds of the grain that's consumed. Uh, I think we produce 150 million bushels and consume probably around uh, 400, 500 million bushels total. So wow. uh, we are a dramatic importer. We were the largest export destination for Ohio corn in years past. I know that um, if we were a separate country. But it, it is, it, it's an important topic because how you establish it, then ratioing, you know, certainly putting more energy in the feed is more costly. If you go back to Tim Staley's reviews and back before we knew anything about amino acid 
ratioing and, and Lee Chiba's lysine to energy work. Um, what you saw was that by increasing fat by 1%, you saved four to five points in peak conversion. And Wayne Cass and I had these conversations that, well, the other benefit was we saw this boost in growth. And I'll be honest with you, in the 80s and 90s, uh, early 90s, mm -hmm. 70s, 80s, and early 90s, the reason that we saw a lot of that growth impact was we had a much uh, more genetically obese animal. So that fat, you, you would feed fat and you would see a markedly fatter animal. And I would tell you today in our very lean lines, you get something at 15 to 17 millimeters of fat. Feeding fat does not change it by very much. Nothing compared to what we saw historically. Um, and I, I mean, you can find examples, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think most people would agree that that's probably a true statement today. And it changes a little bit about how you think about formulation. We don't have to think about the impact on leanness like we used to. And so, you know, uh, that fat, you could, you could establish then an economic value based on this. And, and so I was trying to reconcile, well, what's the right answer? You know, is there a growth rate impact? Isn't there, is it all in increasing fat on the carcass? Um, you know, today, and, and, and when I first started at Murphy's, they, they took fat down from like 25 millimeters to 18, 20 millimeters in less than five years. It was oh, dramatic. Wow. Um, wow. It, it was, uh, and so we had these animals. We didn't, we didn't have to feed, uh, have to worry about the leanness very much. We were still on a uh, carcass leanness premium or back fat and, and muscle depth premium. But most of the value come in muscle depth. And uh, so we, we would have to figure out what was the optimum energy density. Yeah. Just, just, just one question here, Jeff. You mentioned the ratio a little bit, right? Uh, for the folks that are not familiar, uh, there's very easy ways and very complex ways to uh, find the optimal energy level, uh, right? So if you're, if, you know, if we're here sitting on the desk and I'm like, Jeff, I need to know right now in five seconds if I need to feed higher energy or low energy, right? There's a way you can, you can figure that out, right? So if you can ex expand that uh, to the audience. Well, I think you're talking just to the fat to corn ratio, right? Right. Yeah, and, and that is, uh, you know, kind of that historic uh, at water caloric value, right? Um, it's, I think that's 2.2 two, 2 .2 times as much energy in, in uh, fat as there in a, is in a carbohydrate, right? So that, at a minimum, is just a simple way to think about it. Uh, but we would say, uh, honestly, you get below a three to one fat to corn ratio, and we would always have fat in those diets. And, and it depended. Um, I would tell you that in my history, I felt like fat had more value in the most expensive feeds. And so in my formulation method, I would see a ratio of like a five to one. Mm before it would come out in my late nursery diet. Mm -hmm. um, your most expensive feeds, that saves feed. I mean, that it clearly does. So intuitively, it just saves, has the most value in the most expensive feeds. Right. Just like when you feed rec dopamine at the end. Probably, um, but for sure, you, you know, you add a bunch of soy, a bunch of expensive ingredients, you know, I would just add a lot of fat because if I got more growth out of that, they can say, it was a lower cost per pound of gain. Now, a lot of people disagreed with me. I would stick 7% in added fat in the very first nursery diet. And everybody at K-State thought I was dumb. and I didn't care. No, I, was wrong. I wasn't wrong by much. Uh, but ultimately, Dustin Kendall brought it down, brought me back to reality in the 35 to 5% added fat range. Um, Super. But, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, well, so there's a lot of focus on that particular one but then you separate out that first two nursery diets the, the, you know um, when they're transitioning after that I mean it's just like a growth finish pig man it uh, uh, fat saves feed and it always has the most value and the most expensive now there's debate about uh, and the older you get then you get a, a greater impact on gain is what uh, the theory is um, 
So Dustin and I spent a lot of time arguing about this, and we we built these uh, prediction equations for uh, each diet, and we still found that that four or five to one ratio in early growers um, was more valuable. And it, I've tried the K-State equation; it doesn't agree with that, um, which is fine. I mean, you know, pick some data, pick something. You're never going to be wrong. Yeah, pick something right. Right, but plan on moving on from there too. Uh, right. So you can do that and, and you look, it's somewhere early growers, you know, I think it's a four to one and the the lowest you'll get is three to three and a half to one. You get, you get above a three and a half to one and it shouldn't be in most of your finisher diets is what most people would think. Right. That makes total sense. Another one that's a good rule of thumb that I always like to, to uh, think and like your thoughts is, Hey, on average, 1% fat, how much fit efficiency improvement, right? And, and how much growth, if any, I know there's discussions around that too. Yeah, I, I honestly, there, I know Wayne has that in his brain, um, but I can't ever put a percentage. I just know 1% fat, four to five points of feed conversion. Okay, so points. Yeah, I, I yeah. express it there. So that's one and a half, two percent. Yeah, like two percent, right? If you, yeah, okay, yeah, that makes total sense. Yep. I I know historically people talk, hey, one percent fat, one percent growth, and two percent feed efficiency, but and then more recently, one percent fat, point eight percent growth, one point eight percent feed efficiency. But again, system system dependent and all those things and phase. Yeah, and and you can find data to support whatever opinion you want to have. Right. Um, the experience that Dustin and I, when Dustin was working with me at Murphy's, he did a pretty extensive review of, of uh, different bits of modern literature. I think you have to go be careful going back because your leanness factor matters. Um, and I don't hate on old writ literature. You know, that was in my day. It's not yeah. that old. Um, <laughs> but, but in all fairness, uh, you do get into like amino acid ratios that, once you go back too far, it's really hard to interpret it in a modern day context of a lean animal and so forth. But even at that, you know, we would only see growth enhancement up to maybe one to 2% added fat. And beyond that, you would see no change. And, and I liken it to Bob Fritchen when he was at the University of Nebraska many, many years ago, you know, when he fed fat at 1% to keep dust levels down. And so is there an impact in barn that is not necessarily growth related? You saw it as a growth enhancement, right. but it's because of uh, dust or something else. Yeah. Or even palleting sometimes, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, one thing I want to ask you, I uh, still, and I know it's more philosophical probably than, than anything else, but maybe there's data and I don't know, but you mentioned they eat to grow or grow to eat. I know, I know you, you giggle when you said that. So I'm curious uh, and your thoughts? Yeah, I, I challenge my employees on this one because the, the, what it goes back to in my growing up uh, at a and Texas a and you know, we were trained by beef nutritionists largely in energetics. And so, you know, you had to study the, the California net energy system in which they scheduled growth in a feedlot by how much they, you had to calculate the maintenance and then how so much for growth and you would feed them so much to let them grow at a certain rate. And of course, to a swine nutritionist or a poultry nutritionist, that sounded dumb, uh, other than the fair, you know, gestation bar. But you want them to grow as fast as you can, so it, it wasn't intuitive. But if you think of the inverse of that is that, well, if you're limiting intake and limiting energy, um, they could only grow so much. And so then you go, okay, well, growth is not, um, it is really the driver of that. And you look at the energy systems for the dairy industry. Um, so if you look at milk production uh, or cow growth, uh, whatever activity you want to focus it into, the way that these other uh, larger animal species have characterized energy uh, and energetics is related to mass and mass accretion, some productive function. Uh, and that was like the first thing I did when I left university. I bought all these NRCs and read 
uh, read parts of them. I didn't read all of them, but mm -hmm. for sure the dairy NRC um, and the beef NRC, and then the horse NRC, which was really uh, fascinating because that that year, which is a lot of years ago, they laid out the guidelines for working horses for pleasure horses. So now they related it to activity or uh -huh. work. So in every one of the, all three of those species, you look at it and you go, well, they define intake relative to the energetics for maintenance and this productive function. Um, they, you know, it wasn't ever about the inverse of that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my starting bias. And then when I started at, at Murphy's, you know, I was trying to get prediction of a prediction equation for intake. And if you looked at the NRC, shoot, I don't think they published one since like 1970 something. And it was the dumbest thing. It was just a prediction equation. They're going to eat this. And, and you're like, well, that's not, that's completely wrong. It's wrong every day in every situation. And so I couldn't reconcile. Uh, and I remember Jerome Picus, um, who studied CCK at Mark. Uh, in play center, I, I know Jerome, and, and he said they they had hyperalimentated some pigs, and I want to say they killed them. So you, there's a point at which they can't. There, there's a regulatory aspect to that, and so it. I don't like the context of how people say intake drives growth. It doesn't. Um, if you restrict intake, you will restrict growth. That is a true statement, mm -hmm. but that's because you you have a maintenance requirement and you think of it in the context of these other species. And so what I did with, uh, Dean and I used to go around on a few things and that was when he was at PIC. And so I was trying to develop uh, an intake model for a pig. And ultimately I, I did a nonlinear regression on a bunch of data I had and found that it was quite simply described as, you know, A times average daily gain plus B times body weight to the C power. And C was between 0.6 and 0.66, which, you know, Nouble and all the other people would, uh, any, any European would say that's probably more right than 0.75. Okay, yeah. And in those models, I could come up and, and uh, explain just on raw feed intake, you know, uh, R squared of 0.78 to 0.95. Um, you know, most single experiments, you're in a 0.95 type range on intake. Fat feeding levels would, you know, you could account for those. If you did ME, any, any one of those was a better predictor than was just intake. But if you tie the inverse of that, and that is you say that intake drives growth, you will not find a model that is as robust and repeatable. And so it'll end up being in the 0.5 because gross what is not predictable. Animals get sick. Josh Selsby, one of, one of the smartest guys of my modern era, only because he showed that these uh, cells in heat stress can't basically take the garbage out. Now, that's the simple, uh, the Hansen review of that, you know. <laughs> but literally, the, the thermodynamics don't allow those cells to uh, expulse their waste. Mm. It's, it's a therm thermal dynamic problem. And the same would be true. It's a, it's a uh, substrate and product problem. It is purely thermal, uh, I say thermodynamic, but it could be, um, oh, the, what's the e equilibration, you know? I mean, you just can't move the process. So it's pretty intuitive to me that the cells you know, are stuck, they're regulating, they're re regulating intake, of course, um, but that intake is generally regulated to meet the energy requirement. Now, they can move just a little bit of, you know, if you're off by your lysine just a little bit, they can overeat just a little bit and store that, and that's why you tend to see them get a little fatter if it's off by a little bit. Mm. Uh, but, you know, uh, Wayne Green, uh, uh, who taught me nutrition and at a and gave us this article, I think it was in Science, and it's remarkable how close animals eat to their lifetime uh, energy requirements. Mm -hmm. If you define it in that kind of an equation, um, we, we eat to within like a hundred thousandth of our requirement. 
So even though I'm slightly obese, <laughs> I still ate to my majority of my requirement. I mean, it, it, it didn't take much to, to accumulate this little bit of extra love that I've got on me. Interesting. Well, do you think on that topic, Jeff, do you think the, you know, all these models trying to predict intake, okay, well, if the temperature changed and then the intake changed that much and blah, blah, blah. For me, sometimes it almost feel like a utopic, a dream sometimes. I think it's honor, honorable, but sometimes from a practical standpoint, at least for the short term, because we work with production systems and that's a big ship that changes very slowly, then if I look at the average of that system and you have all this noise, right? But, but the average is going to change just a little bit and it's extremely hard to predict every single pig, every single bar, super hard, right? So what's your thoughts on, hey, shouldn't we be doing models like the energy one that we worked on with Jose Soto and, and K-State was more, and PIC was more like, you know what I mean, from an overall ship standpoint, the whole system. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I'll give you a better example. Every year I had to predict for a budget the feed conversion um, in every division, for every feed mill in their diet. So we, we built those models, and then we'd look at the variance. And most of the time, you could very accurately predict the system performance. And when you would find deviation, that you, of course, look for those deviations. And you're looking for things like pellet quality and particle size and, and of course, mortality, age of mortality, place weight, sale weight, how fast they grow. If you could have predicted those accurately, you would have nailed fee conversion. So to your point, the intake is absolute. I, I would tell you that we could predict to within a point on the feed conversion. Um, right. I was the one running that. So all my friends at Murphy's and Smithfield would say, well, you just made that data up. <laughs> but the truth is that yeah. it, it is known what the impact of daily gain and mortality and when those animals die. If you can account for those things, they are knowable. They're not predictable, but they're knowable once they occur. Right. All of a sudden, you find that your variances become very small and are explainable. All right. Um, and so what's the next step here? Uh, M, E, N, E. So what's yeah, so this big? Depends on where you're at, really. If you're in Brazil at an, out in uh, Mato Grosso, you're going to feed corn and soybean meal. Pretty sure. Um, if you're in Iowa, you're going to feed pretty much corn and soybean meal. There's maybe some fat, maybe some DDGs. Um, the, the, the interesting part is ME works just fine. We've got tremendous data on ME on a really broad range of ingredients. We're getting closer on ME. Um, so I think today you could use either one. But as you get broader, the Europeans who have a wider selection historically of ingredients, whether that's barley and rye and tapioca, and just have a, a, a much more diverse palette of products, NE is more valuable in those situations. You don't have to have NE to do corn and soy. Right, right. I mean, it's just, there, there's a relationship that's different um, between caloric efficiency and ME level, whereas it tends to be flat for any. I mean, that's our objective for any, right? Right. So, you know, I think uh, pick a system. The biggest thing is it's relative values because your role as a nutritionist is to establish the relative value of each product so that the procurement person knows what to purchase for the animals. The goal is not formulation. The goal is to feed a set of animals and make money. And so you got to, you know, people have to get past this idea that it's all this technical mumbo jumbo. You make all your, you know, the perfect formulation. And if that thing isn't executed right, um, then that's irrelevant. But purchasing is one of those aspects. You have to remember your job is to provide that. Typically the buyer with some capability to value products relative to uh, all the different options out there. Very good. Anything else on, on establishing the energy level 
No, I think uh, we didn't talk briefly about stochastics, did we? No, we, we didn't. Yeah. Yeah, that's no. one that um, the the thing I learned down here is is uh, each ingredient has uh, variants, and corn has on a dry matter basis probably the least amount of variants, or soybeans, if you get them from the same region. Soybeans from Brazil versus soybeans from North Carolina will be different. Um, but in general, they have uh, less variants than other products. So whether that's a DDG, a meat and bone meal. Meat and bone meal is a classic example. We had one bin and we bought meat and bone meal from three different plants and it was three different products. So what is the value of that purchase? Well, I needed to recognize that um, that variance was bad. I, I represent the average um, and that's not necessarily the real feeding value. And so what I uh, spent a little time understanding from different people was stochastic formulation. I checked out Bob Brills and I wrote a nice article on this uh, with uh, uh, Tom Delafonso. So Tom Delafonso really did uh, help Bob Brill build, build his stochastic formulation aspect. I'm like, this is fantastic. I love this. It gives me the ability to take into account uh, this variance. The problem was it didn't help me solve that problem of a highly invariable ingredient. All of those three bone meal, meat and bone meals were going into one bin mm -hmm. at any one point in time. Not at the same time either, by me. And so maybe I should have had multiples, but now I had to have three different bins and that wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. So then, the, you know, and, and that's just the way it was going to work. And so what we figured out was um, if you take, you can take and apply that variation in the formulation method, which was what Tom was describing, um, but it didn't help me in my purchasing. And so I could apply that same variance for my purchasing uh, side on my matrix and mean minus some fraction of the standard deviation. And it didn't accomplish the same thing necessarily as stochastics, but it helped me value my ingredients. And that's, that's, again, the key role is a purchasing role. We're supporting that purchasing person. And so taking that fraction on the front side of your matrix helps you improve your purchasing decision. Very interesting. Do you have a recommendation for the... Uh, I go with the half standard deviation. Half, half standard yep. deviation. All right. And how about um, your overall thoughts on pelleting and particle size? Well, so, you know, I came through K-State when Joe Hancock was doing his fantastic work on, on uh, particle size. Um, and it, it's some of the most important work in my career, you know, uh, as a swine nutritionist since the 80s to now. I think particle si understanding the value of particle reduction is probably the, one of the single most valuable things that's been done. And so... Right. You know, hats off to Joe for doing that, leading that charge. Um, the other aspect of that is then pelletizing. In order to handle a very finely ground product, um, you had to you had to pelletize it ultimately, or use a big Dutchman liquid feeding system. And no one in the southern U.S. was ever going to do that because of mold and and the mess that it creates. But um, ultimately, I believe those two tie together, and uh, Pelleting in early years, um, we said created 12, 13% improvement in feed conversion. The reason why is because they had to grind it fine to make a pellet worth of crap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that sounds like Wayne Cass saying that, but that's the truth. Um, mm -hmm. These guys, uh, they, the old feed commercial feed manufacturers had to grind fine to make a pellet worth the darn. And so those you can't uncouple. Uh, what you can say is that separately, pelleting uh, does not, there's no amount of that little bitty amount of gelatinization that's relevant on the side of a pellet relative to digestibility. The value of pelletizing predominantly comes from the particle reduction, and we need to uh, pelletize that finely ground product in order to handle it effectively or to handle a diverse range of products to create a more uniform bulk density. And so in a nutshell, those two ideas have to come together at some point. 
Um, and Charles Stark, when, when I first started at Murphy's, he and I, you know, both came through the K-State program when we were studying particle size. And uh, they had roller mills, all these giant monstrosity, 55-inch roller mills, um, whatever the width is. Uh, they were enormous, but they had to be adjusted continuously. And so one of the first projects that, uh, when I first started at Murphy's, was we lost, for some reason, like a thousand tons of feed. It just quit happening. And one of the things they did was they went from these roller mills and replaced them with hammer mills. And we found out, I think we were producing at the chief, you know, 16 to 20,000 tons a week, somewhere mm -hmm. in that neighborhood. Um, and we lost 500 tons is what Charles and I could come up with just on particle size reduction that we didn't need any. Well, there were some weight changes, some other things, but um, it, that was the first lesson that, wow, particle size mattered. We were able to drop it from, you know, 650 down to 550 or some number like that. Um, and we, we, we lost all these tons. So then ultimately, and again, when you're far from the corn pile, that basis matters. Right. We had tremendously expensive corn. And so then you need to extract every, every ounce out of it. And we got hung up on some of the early work from uh, Brett Healy, you know, when they looked at uh, a Kelly Wandra, where they looked at efficiency and how the K-State data said with like a three inch grinder, it was terribly inefficient to grind down to below 550 microns. Well, when you made a grinder the size of my office, <laughs> um, it took no more energy to grind it to 100 microns than it did to 550. Oh, wow. I mean, it's eight cents a ton no matter what you did. And, you know, the scale is just what people missed um, with that particle size stuff. So for us, we understood that value tremendously. And, uh, and we made bigger and bigger grinders. And we invested in one in a feed mill. And we're like, what the heck happened to feed conversion over there? You know, we, well, we got a truck size grinder then. And ultimately, I can tell you by the time I was leaving, we were targeting below 300 microns. Um, and my goal was to have a mill at 100 microns, if that gives you some perspective. Not all lines like fine particles. Um, some respond poorly to that. Um, it's not a genetic problem because my geneticist friends, Matt Culbertson in mm -hmm. particular, um, would say there's no genetic link. Well, that's true, but it's either line or breed or, you know, line, stuff, right, stuff because it's, it's not occurring in some and it's occurring in others. But, uh, but if you can handle it, I mean, you're taking diets. We had diets in the 90 to 95% digestible range in reality. Wow. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> so of course, like I said, the, some lines that makes sense. And then, and then on top of that, if there's more disease challenges, right? In some of the flows, it's, it's even worse, right? Yeah, that's one that Harry Snelson, when I first started at NC State, 93, they had an ulcer task force. Harry was at Carroll's. I think Hammer was at, at Murphy's at the time, different veterinarians. But what, what Harry, uh, in the reports that I read, could really see was that you would have um, – like a mycoplasma, zero conversion for mycoplasma is when those animals would start expressing these ulcers and they would bleach out. I mean, they'd be pure white, their ears would go pure white, they'd have massive ulcers in their stomachs. Um, it was horrible. And they had a lot of mortality. Um, but I can tell you, this, the same systems and the same barns, 20 years later, we were at like 200, 250 micron and none of it. I mean, you just didn't find them. Yeah. And so I don't know why, but uh, it wasn't because we didn't have mycoplasma either. Um, that some of the things we did over the years, though, we did treatment diets. So we would grind fine and about eight, 12 weeks uh, in, the, in the finishing, um, we would offer up a very coarse ground diet because I want to say Purdue, I always get this wrong, but I want to say Purdue is the one that found that you could intervene with a coarse ground diet and the ulcers would heal. But if you kept feeding them a fine ground diet, they would not heal. Um, Dustin Kendall always told me I was wrong on who I quoted. So I think it's right that it's Purdue. But, um, 
but that uh, that is an important aspect that you could treat these things. Yeah. So so were you doing was that part of the program or sometimes? It was. We got to uh, when we were prior to having our own genetic lines. Um, we were buying commercial genetics, and we saw. Um, I mean, we had to do something. The value of grinding fine was understood, but the problem was we had two percent higher mortality, and we could do an intervention and recover a large portion of that. Mm. So we would pelletize these eight hundred. With you know, you'd use a half inch screen on a giant grinder. It made complete crap for pellets, but it, it allowed some of those pigs to heal and, and we gained mortality. Uh, so, I mean, there, there is intervention strategies that can be done. Yeah, that's super interesting. I know you talked about uh, feeding fat. Anything else on that arena that, that we missed? I don't think so. Um, I think you covered that. Least cost per pound of gain, I think we talked about uh, just briefly. I do want to talk about that, you know, we built a formulation method to, that actually solved for the optimum energy density. And unfortunately, when you add in milling and delivery, so as, as energy goes down, more feed is demanded for the same amount of gain. So that there's an extra cost of milling and delivery. And so we tried to incorporate that into, um, it, well, it was built into our formulation. Mm -hmm. So it may be a truly linear function for just energy, it ends up being quadratic when you incorporate milling and delivery. So there's no one that's doing uh, a nonlinear uh, solver at this point that I'm aware of. And so that's a concern, but it was a gentle curve. And so we solved that, Bill Holder solved that by doing intersecting energy ranges, which were approximated linear enough that we never ended up with a dual optimum. Because what your fear is in formulation is that, you know, you come down and yeah. you go up and then you come back down. Dual optimum is a problem because it can't solve for it. Um, there's, not a, there's not a single unique solution. That's the key thing about uh, uh, least cost formulation and, and linear solvers. And so he, he would segment that, and that worked well enough and today, that process or that program, we had it custom built, and uh, and that thing is still in use today there. And I, to my knowledge, that's the only place in the world that does that and solves with that. Wow. And it, there is a least cost per calorie method that I think it was Randy Mitchell um, helped uh, Bill Holder come to. And it, it just gave the cost per calorie. On an NE basis, that's very useful, too. Yeah. So, so let me ask you, on that arena, it's not accounting for the pig price, right? So my question is, good markets, bad markets? Yeah, so the marginal cost, so where profit optimization occurs, marginal cost equals marginal revenue, right? So your marginal cost, um, your revenue is not changing. Uh, again, I assume there was no change in growth rate. So that that's, goes back to one of my right. very first points. Right. It was more important for me to decide uh, how to establish energy density. And it was much simpler if I just decided that gain didn't change. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I just stuck my head in the sand. No. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But you can apply into that function, Marcio, then the uh, value through fee conversion or through energetics, you can come back and enhance the value of uh, energy density too. So you can just give it a, a steeper slope um, to try to mimic that value. And so there's different ways, techniques, techniques you can do it. But uh, I felt that we could always solve, whether it was me or um, Rob Musser uh, believes that, you know, fat, you know, feeding fat creates more average daily gain. We could solve both of those problems. He would just have a different slope than I would the least cost per pound of gain method. And that thing, because it's not intuitive. If you solve for an energy level, well, now you got a choice between adding fat or adding mitts and some blend of those two or DDGs. Well, that's not intuitive. The right answer might be adding fat and adding mitts. Right, right. Or adding neither or adding one or adding just mids. Mm -hmm. And so 
that was the value of doing this. We could more fairly value all of our purchasing decisions and our buyers, it made sense to them, they understood how to, and could then formulate strategies for that. Very interesting. Yep. Before we move here, Jeff, to the you know managing the nutrition program, another point that I think it's important for uh, a new nutritionist taking over a production system is your thoughts on hey, good mar- good, uh, and again goes. I don't think it goes like you said. It depends on growth or not. If you're taking into account on energy, but but let's zoom out and think about the overall diet. Um, Good times versus bad times, folks you're on, on that investment versus no saving money, cash flow, reduce the bleeding, uh, you know, the financial bleeding. What are your overall thoughts on that, especially the yeah. current situation? Yeah, how timely of a, a question, Marcio. And of course, I thought about um, the current situation as you mentioned that, because what I said was what, and I, I said this in 1998, um, we were. We were owned by Murphy Farms, Wendell Murphy, and the question was to me, what are you going to do differently today um, now that hogs are $8? And the answer at that time was, um, in my mind at that time, this is young and naive me, younger naive for me. (laughs) If if I wasn't doing what was right before, there's nothing I'm going to do that really, uh, you know, is any more right. The only thing that that didn't apply to was cash conservation. And so yeah, right. depends on your situation. And we did not in 98 face a situation where we couldn't get our pigs killed like we can today. Right. And so there are, there are a host of different decisions that a person uh, can make. And I'll give you the best example I've got. We, we go into the fall of the year. Um, down in, 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 in this area, and I don't know if you know this, but there's no feed mill that's ever been built that didn't have like 10% more demand than it had capacity for like the day after it was built. We planned for one number, and then for whatever reason, we added 10% more to it. Um, and so they're all undersized. But down here, we would see a 10% change in feed demand going out of the summer and into the fall. So weekly feed demand would go up by 10%. And we made 60,000 tons uh, in the central region, 60, 70,000 tons in North Carolina. So that's that's a whole feed mill shift from bottom to top, 7,000 tons. And so the dilemma uh, of that is what happens when you get behind? And oh, by the way, we have hurricanes down there. Yeah. And they will, mess up your dadgum uh, feed delivery and all that. So you get behind, you run out of capacity. What can you do? And honestly, we never, I never really thought about this until the recent turn of events where we started looking at why might we actually slow a pig down um, where you're trying to hold them. Well, that same thing could apply. That, That is one thing I probably could have done uh, very differently, and I missed that, you know, back then. Um, and so, I, you know, that that's a big one. There is a time where you could actually slow pigs down and save money, allow yourself to get caught up on feed. Uh, you get into weather events yeah. and uh, inclement weather events using a, you know, we sell a product for restricting intake. That's a great situation, actually. Uh, to use that in. You're so far behind, you can't get caught up. You intervene with a strategy like that to back everybody off. Yeah, you're going to give up weight. But if that allows you to get all your animals fed um, in a fairly short period of time, that is a real big, big change that I never really thought through in my career at at, uh, Smithfield. So that's one where you can conserve cash and your objective is different. Um, you know, you were trying to hold pigs, and I never thought that was a good idea until today. Right, because basically, sure, your return on that pigs is not as good as when you're holding, but uh, could be worse, right? So you're... Could be, and if you're pressing it into a different time window, and that's what, 
if you can hold your pigs and buy somebody else's, well, then that, you know, just saying as a packer, that might not be a horrible idea. But um, yeah. there are, there's different strategies you can envision. Super uh, today, there's, there's a lot of people need to get rid of a lot of pigs. If you can hold yours, that, that could be an economic decision uh, that you should look at. Um, not saying it's right or wrong, but yeah. Uh, but there is some of these scenarios. I, I never believed in hedging a loss. I thought that was the dumbest thing ever. And it is until you look at if you're in if you're a banker investing in somebody and you look at the remaining variable costs. Yeah. If you're looking at a return. And again, as a banker, I would say you should hedge that because yeah. what's fixed is fixed. What's done is done. Right. I need you to lock this in for me now. Lose less money. Well, again, the from a remaining variable cost standpoint, it's a profit, and uh, and you know what it's going to be, and that's predictable for a banker and someone that's taking risk with you uh, at a particular point in time uh, that you're stressed. That could be a good thing. Um, one of the poorest decisions I ever saw. I know a good friend of mine uh, was at a production company in '98. And he was told he had to cut X out of his diet, X dollars. Ten, you have to cut 10 bucks a ton. So, I mean, I'm going to tell you about the only thing you can do is cut fat. Um, yeah. And you pay the piper in about three weeks. So that first load of feed is cheaper. And then it comes three days earlier. And you're like, yeah, that didn't help me. It made it worse, in fact. Yeah. Um, so there are some, some really crazy things, but additives, uh, and if you think about this, paling, um, as an integrated enterprise, you know, paling, if it makes more pounds, and uh, you may be losing on the live side, but they're gaining on, net gaining on the packing side, you know, that's one you'd keep in. If you're losing today, if you're losing money today, creating more pounds at a loss is not a good idea. So you would say, well, I'll throw paling out. And it's a great product. It's horrible what's, why it's not used, but uh, it's a fantastic product. Uh, but there's a clear example. If you're in late finishing and your prospects are you're going to lose money, I, you know, it's like cutting icing. That's not a horrible decision if, you're, if your animals are going to get discounted to no value by growing too much. And yeah. so there are some situations. But then as you move back, the further back you go, um, you know, it, it begs the question whether you should be in the business or not. If, if you, uh, if you can make more pigs and sell them in the future and they're profitable, you know, leave your sow additives. They're typically the most valuable to your enterprise. Um, but the closer you get to the harvest time in a really struggling, struggling market, I think that's a, that's one, the closer to, to when you have to sell, uh, especially if it's increasing weight, in today's world, that's not a great thing. And I think most people recognize that uh, if you can't sell your pigs, making them get bigger isn't a, isn't a winning proposition. Right. Very interesting. So I guess for me, one of the highlights you mentioned is basically it's good to have an emergency diet on your formulation software. Of course, you might tweak a little bit, but it's there if you need it. Storms, tornadoes, hurricanes, the next virus – Hopefully not, but it's good to have something like that. Next topic here, Jeff. Uh, so managing the nutrition program, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, just uh, I wanted to cover that briefly because most people don't recognize we don't feed animals based on their weight. We schedule a budget typically based on, and, and the bigger the system is, the more important it is to have a budgeting method in which you have a standard application, um, but you're not, you can't have people out there deciding what they're going to feed. That, that never works. And so you need to be able to manage that for variances in place weight, movements of barns. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen. But most typically it's, you know, a truckload of a product or a half truckload, depending on the size of your operations. I think in, in uh, chickens, it's like they get four deliveries of X, Y, Z, and that's it. You know, um, we get uh, 18 or so, 15 to 18 deliveries in a finisher nursery. Um, so scheduling that based on the barn size and monitoring that. 
that's the one thing that you, you, you are personally responsible. I'm going back to you. You have a personal responsibility of the execution. So having a budget and monitoring it. Um, I saved 40, 50 cents a pig by doing that. And I was in, people didn't like me because of that, but they had planned to place X, they placed Y, we overfed them by a dollar a head. And I'm telling you, it was 20, 30 cents a head um, to get that thing right. Maybe as much as 40 to 50 cents a head. Now we would have 10, you know, less than 15 cents a head variance um, that just from normal stuff, just rounding of pockets and trucks and so forth, uh, it's not going to be zero, but there was 30 to 40 cents a head on the table every time. And I spent, you know, a big portion of my career focusing on that because it's about execution every day. And so that, and then, uh, you know, QA, you know, if you think of QA in the sense of we, uh, Charles and I always did, you know, analytical variation. And we finally set up for years um, particle size, pellet quality, moisture, and fat. So those four things had an economic impact that we could draw from uh, doing an analysis and we would set it versus a target. So they had a standard for pellet quality. Um, and in our days, it was 30% when Dustin and I was there. We set it down to zero because we couldn't justify even 30%. So it would just give us an absolute value uh, on pellet fines. But, you know, um, moisture, protein, and fat, we didn't want to send water out. We wanted our fat to be ad, uh, applied accurately. So there's a penalty once you see the 10% on the upper and on the lower. And we would calculate those penalties for the operations uh, leads at the feed mills. And, and then we would look at our QA and we'd test feed and, and we'd say, oh, well, it needs to be this percent of theoretical. And I'll be honest with you, that's one I never did a lot with except Phytase. Phytase is one that ultimately you should do the analysis on the finished product and um, you should have zero samples ever fall below 90% of your theoretical. Zero. Um, and honestly, you can never afford to be wrong. So from an analytical standpoint, I would set it at zero. So even on the liquid systems, the errors are so expensive, you had to uh, just, just overfeed it. And that's actually why I believe super dosing works is because people think they're actually adding phytase and they're mm. shocked when they find out they might not be adding it at what they thought they were. And so you can never afford to be wrong with iTunes. Great product, great technology. Best one of, I had it on my, uh, one of the major advancements in my career was yeah. my piece. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're going to get back to that, but, but I definitely agree. Um, well, yeah, and then the final piece of that, Marcio, right as I was leaving, I, I actually thought our feed mills were fantastic. Uh -huh. And then I started looking at like their individual batch data. I'm like, dang. Yeah, they are not as good as I thought they were, mm -hmm. and so I mean, you know, we we've invested in in uh, helping customers identify and, and manage and monitor that because it is it's it's so important, and it's people are sh shocked, and you can't find it with all the best testing in the world, um, you, you can't find it, and when the scale tells you they are not, then you you have to believe it. On that arena, Jeff. Okay, so what would be the top three key performance indicators if you're starting today as a nutritionist that you must have there? Yeah, now, where are you talking about for... Uh, overall, overall, could be, could be finishing sales, feed meal. What would be from your experience, hey, these three here, I need to see it. I need to see it on a weekly basis, a daily basis, or something like that. I, I, I focused on moisture, uh, grain moisture. I don't know that there is just three. Um, There's probably more, but I'm saying, hey, you better be doing this. You know what I mean? You know, I, I think you have to get down to execution. So knowing where your moisture is at initially so you get an understanding is one of the most important things from a formulation. I think uh, knowing where your toxins are is important if you're in a risky area. I think um, 
speed conversion to me is not an indicator because I always varied energy dramatically. Um, so I would, I would come back. My batching accuracy would be at, right at the top of my list. Um, and then I'd come back to my South even take. Very good. No, and I like it. It's funny because you say, um, you, you, you say, Hey, you know, I wouldn't look at fit efficiency and I agree. Uh, but almost like as a no event, like, right. But a lot of people around the globe, that's the first thing they look, which is crazy. It's a huge opportunity. I think for a lot of folks. To well, know. It, it depends on what you know. So if you don't know, um, I would tell you that you can explain fee conversion very easily. What you can't explain is growth rate and mortality. And, and so, you know, like I said, I, I focused on, a, I'd call it adjusted fee conversion. And we would, uh, we did a crossover. So we'd take our budget and then we would adjust for the things. Had we budgeted for this growth rate and this mortality, uh, because I generally don't believe that, you know, the feed caused those animals. It may have caused those animals to die. I mean, it, that's possible, right? Uh, it may have caused it to be bad. But on the whole, um, uh, an accurately manufactured feed in which 95% of all pigs live and seem to perform normally, you don't draw a conclusion that feed was a significant contributor to mortality, as an example. How did it isolate those? That's why I say that. Um, but if you could account for those things, then it allows you to track the residual. So it's a residual analysis, right? And that's what's important to you, because then you can start discovering, well, what's contributing to that? Is it because I overvalued my uh, DDGs and, oh, yeah, the, darn it, their, their fat levels lower than I thought. They've been burned, maybe buy it from a bad supplier. Um, all those, but uh, the biggest changes um, that I've seen in my career. So we, when we weaned a bigger pig or an older pig, older is probably a more important term. Older pig, and we graded correctly, we gained 50 points of average daily gain, somewhere between 40 and 50. We moved from a 155 to a two 195 to 205 system level average in many of our divisions. And, you know, it's just, you quit overstocking. I mean, there's really stocking density, the quality of that pig coming out, and then grading them correctly. Uh, we're such huge contributors to um, that system change. But for each point of gain, we dropped feed conversion by a point. I mean, that's the other part that uh, most people don't realize. I always say it's a point for point. Um, I'm probably wrong. I don't remember what it is nowadays, but for each one point increase in average daily gain, you get a, uh, a reduction in fee conversion. And going back to my model, uh, my intake model, Marcio, it's about a point. Um, and so it is a predictable change is, is really, I guess, what I'm trying to say. And you can assign it to energy. Um, we, we could do an analysis, a residual analysis where I build back um, to the week when feed was delivered, I had summarized the feed production for that week, the composition of that by mill, and we could basically build up what every group was fed, the average composition of what they were fed. I could then come in and assign an average particle size and uh, pellet quality. Um, so I'd get energy density, some prediction of all those things. And not surprisingly, those all became very significant. And so you could see their impacts on feed conversion. And uh, not just because it's, I mean, they were really significant like, and, and matched what we expected out of some of our research. And so, you know, that was pretty impressive and exciting. We had a lot of, lot of data. Um, it's still production data. It's not research data. But, you know, we overcame it with volume. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the beauty of large data sets, being able to see those trends as long as you, people understand the difference between ca causality and association and those things. Right. Yeah. In these cases, they were, they were, you were just looking for, you know, can you eke out that effect? 
and and it was not a pro prescriptive change either. And those are those are harder to find because they get lost in the noise. Very good, Jeff. Um, how about production concerns that uh, new nutritionists should be aware of? Yeah, and this is one that you and I like to talk about. Is uh, I told you one of my key KPIs is south south peak consumption. Of all the things that um, I learned, feeding. Keep, keep them thin to make them win is the old saying I think we used to have. Mm -hmm. uh, but feeding sows too much is a bad thing. And feeding them too much energy. So um, I have a friend that he'd been to Chile. He's like, oh, they're feeding 1,900 pounds of gestation. And so we need to feed our sows 1,900 pounds. And I'm going to tell you, that was a horrible decision. They were feeding 1,900 pounds because they were feeding like 40% mids. Some, and we were feeding corn and soy, probably with a percent added fat to keep it not less dusty. Right, right. Um, and probably fine ground on top of that. So, yeah. you know, they needed to eat about 1,450 pounds a year. Uh, right. gestation feed. Yeah. And on that point, Jeff, like I said, 14 to 19, well, the difference in energy from those diets is probably less than 10, very likely less than, less than 10%. So pr they were probably overfeeding too, right? Oh, the 1900, yeah. uh, when we overfed those, th that was a disaster. We had yeah. teeth falling out. We had all kinds of crap going on. But fat sows are horrible things. Um, yeah. The 1900, again, that for their low energy diets, it was probably right. You think? I, I still think it's probably high. Uh, if forty percent mids, probably it probably would be right. I don't know. Okay. Um, they were probably overfeeding. Comes, you know. I'm not going to debate it with you because I don't know. Yeah. Okay. No. no. Okay. The key, but the key on that, Marcio, was so our sow herd data. We recorded inventories every quarter um, for our accounting system. And uh, I might have so I, I might have been monthly, but for sure quarterly. And uh, I think we called in inventories every month for our sow herd because we just needed to uh, reconcile our books because you mm -hmm. close and you close those quarterly. Mm -hmm. And so from an accounting perspective, we had that data. But I could correlate three months worth of gestation intake to a lactation intake, and they were perfectly inversely related. I know that doesn't surprise you, yeah. but it is absolutely true. We would see where we overfed sows, they would have reduced lactation intake without, without a doubt. Right. And, uh, and so that's an important thing. One, one of the topics that I like to say is uh, when I first started at, at Murphy's and, and NC State, so I'm, you know, figuring out how to feed to meet the energy demand seemed like a much more intuitive answer. The whole bump feeding thing, I, I was never a fan of it. Um, it just seemed like you were just getting fat and a lot of feed in the sow. And we had a lot of impaction problems. Um, we, you know, we had timers on water, so we might have been restricting water intake a little bit. You know, we have to manage water differently in North Carolina. We have lagoons that have to be managed. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I think it's a real challenge. Um, the understanding of obesity in the sow herd. I, I know that's a passion of yours. It's been a passion of mine. Uh, Ray Summerlin and I were on a plane coming back from Jimmy Tosh's. Um, we, we were looking at when Jimmy was just getting started, we had given him some PERS infected pigs and brought him PERS. He's welcome for that. You know, in those days we didn't know it, but, um, but we were coming back and, and we ultimately decided uh, on a, a strategy for feeding our sows the uh, PIC method of, of uh, body condition score was, it, it was just too much. We needed to simplify the decision. And ultimately what Ray and I agreed on was that they could make a decision on is she in condition or not. Interesting. And we'd do this every two weeks. So the manager would walk by and they'd have somebody in the front, somebody in the back, and they'd say, is the sow okay? If they're okay, you just move on. If they're too thin, then they get bumped up. If they're too fat, they get bumped down. It's that, it was literally, and then two weeks you come back and, and check them again. Not the next day, 
you had to give them time. Yeah. And so then they had a way, I believe they have a way that they go through the state now and do that, you know, certain times, uh, days that they have, you know, certain roads they go to do. But it, you can't do it every day. You can't do it every week. It's, it's going to take 10 days or so to really see a change in those animals. But they start that conditioning immediately, too. Some of the other things that we found, um, we were always restricting intake at breeding um, because there was a study that yeah. somebody found on uh, bump feeding, uh, overfeeding gilts. And they saw that it reduced uh, increased embryonic mortality or something like that. Yeah. And if you look at the actual study, it's because they were fat. This was fat yeah. gilts fed a lot of feed. And I said, guys, here's what's going to happen. Because as a 13-year-old farrowing house manager in 1976, you know, that's what you should do is put a 13-year-old in charge of your damn sows um, because they know so much. Yeah. I, can, I can remember those big old Danish landries coming out of the farm, out of the farrowing house that were a solid six inches wide because I was a farrowing house manager, feeding them twice a day, a scoop of each time, whether they needed it or not. You know, I was horrible. I did a horrible job. Yeah. And, and we had to get these animals back in condition. So we would have a sow that would milk tremendously. And it, it likens it back to an old story they tell in Texas about the Herefords. The Herefords at the turn of the 1800s to 1900s were fantastic milkers. And then they made some dumb recommendation, you know, about having a calf every year and cull all the ones that didn't. Well, they cull their best milking cows. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we end up doing. We have to get these animals back in condition, make sure we feed them right. We fed, moved to feeding four times a day in the farrowing house, four to six times a day. And in the summer, which starts for us in mid-May, we started a summer sow program in which we started feeding at 3 and 4 a.m. Because guess what? They don't eat during the damn heat of the day. And we wanted that heat rise of digestion uh, to not correspond to a breeding event. Whether or not that had any real outcome, I'm just going to tell you it made good sense. And so you ought to do that anyway. And so we had to be out of that farm by 2 p.m., I want to say, in those days. And uh, people were, were at home and relaxing during the heat of the day. Get all your feeding done. And, and then we moved to automated feeders, which was even smarter yet. So that sow could get up. And, but we had clean out that feed. We always made sure they had fresh feed. And uh, we, we wasted a lot of lactation feed. But we had great sow productivity as an outcome from it. So keep them thin to make them win. Feed them when the demand is there. Don't restrict them in the farrowing house. Makes total sense. No, that's perfect. Yeah. And like you said, right, Jeff, I mean, this whole thing about gestation, too much gestation feed, too, uh, they eat less lactation. It's one of the few areas, I think, in, in pig production that's like, it's black and white. It's going to happen. We can bet money. In, but not many people sometimes realize that. No, I, I think that uh, they don't. It's really a long period of time for people to think about it. And so left to production, they, they don't, they don't look at those relationships. Yes. And then you get into the obvious, right? Oh, but they, well, the fetuses are growing, so they need feed. Well, they do, but you, I mean, so in that case, you start off at three pounds of feed and you work them up to 4.2 instead of <laughs> four and a half. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which it's, is it's amazing. Yeah. And they're highly conserved. That sow will uh, make that fetus at, at her expense. I mean, that's true in most species. They would right. be right. very difficult to abort. Yeah. Very interesting. One, uh, I just want to give a comment here, Jeff, on early gestation. Like you said, the, what do you call, uh, you know, there was that old study, and I agree that, that you know, they're fat and there's too much feed. Now, there's one study Coming out, uh, let's see here, uh, was, was accepted a, a while ago here, a month or two ago from Dr. Malman, uh, Andre Malman from Brazil there. Uh, super interesting, okay? I just want to bring that up. They fed 1.8 kg of a corn soy diet, 2.5 and 3.2 for no ideal, let's call it ideal condition, okay? And 
when you give a 3.2 kg, which what seven pounds, seven pounds of uh, roughly seven pounds there from a corn soy diet, that reduced total born uh, about one. So the point is, if they're ideal, you you don't need to give a seven pound to ideal uh, ideal sow, and I think or good, and and I think we we would agree on that, right? Yeah, I think the other thing you have to keep in mind, uh, Marcio, is we don't need a bunch of eight hundred pound sows. So we are restricting feeding and watching your coals. Um, so we tried to keep our prime coals in, in the five hundred to five fifty range. Um, and so we would, we were intentionally trying to keep their weight down. They take up less space in the farrowing house. They tend to not lay on pigs as much. Um, that's one of the beauties of the Michon, right? That we looked at for all those years is fairly small body size. Um, you know, they don't fill up the crates. Uh, those are all real issues. I, I would prefer to not have a, a 600 pound coal sow. You know, I'd, I'd rather she be five. 50 or 500, you know, at six periods. Because I don't have to maintain her. I mean, a smaller framed sow is a good thing. I would say we don't understand well today how to keep a sow small framed, yeah. one that really has the potential to grow really, really big. Um, but we also know then, and so guilt, one of the things we found is sows didn't have to lose weight during lactation. They just didn't. Now, gilts generally did, and I think that's because we did. We were feeding single diets at that time. We knew we could uh, feed a gilt diet, um, and I think you could get them close. They would lose like two percent, maybe. But our sows lost zero. Um, you did not have to lose any weight in the farrow house. And so, these gilts. Uh, I, I made a note here. That, you know, they used to eat two pounds less, and that's a big concern. Um, because that's why you have to feed them a higher nutrient dense diet. They have less maintenance energy to stand there, but their milk demand is just as great as a, you know, if they're, because we always stuff them full of pigs too, right? They're the ones with the full udder. So let's fill them up. Right. Interesting. <laughs> no, that's, that's great, Jeff. Um, let's move to the next topic here, Jeff. Uh, so major advance advancements in, nutrition and, and production from that standpoint. Yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, just a couple of these things that I think in my career, I probably missed uh, significantly some things, but, but I think phytase, you know, it's an interesting lesson. We, when we first started talking about phytase, we were taught that that protein was going to be denatured in the gut. So that's a massive advancement. Um, in the state of art of nutrition that we could make a protein last all the way through the stomach and be effective. So that's changed a lot of uh, paradigms about nutrition. And uh, it was just a remarkable technology. Um, helped us also understand phosphorus and the importance of phosphorus. It is one of the first uh, order nutrients. Um, without it, you can't accrete protein, you can't accrete bone. So animals will stop growing. Particle size, I talked about that earlier. I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I think people need to get in their mind that there's no reason we shouldn't be grinding to 100 micron. <laughs> 100 micron yeah. I don't think it matters in soy. I think it absolutely matters in corn. And the value is all in, not in the endosperm, it's in the pericarp and the tip cap and the germ. Um, and, 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 and you mentioned briefly about that, but I know it's a big, big, big concern of folks around the globe and also in the U.S. about, uh, you know, the ulcers, right? You mentioned a little bit about that, but the, what's your overall thoughts there? Yeah, I can't understand why there hasn't been some focus on uh, that. I can tell you there are lines that are not susceptible. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. And then like you also mentioned how... So there's, there's genetic variants out there. Let's put it that, that way. So it is selectable. Yeah, that makes sense. Very nice. How, next one, Jeff. So, I, and I had down, you know, lean pigs in my career. And I think we're pretty stable there. Pork quality. Um, I think one of the massive uh, advancements was ideal protein to energy ratios. 
So the combination of Lee Chiba's work and uh, others that did the energy to calorie ratio or energy to uh, protein ratios and then the ideal protein. To me, that one's just uh, such an important aspect. And, and I think paleo. Uh, paleo was such a fun advancement. I hate to. And, and DDGs. DDGs was incredibly uh, painful. And when we first started seeing that, uh, and we knew that transition was going to be horrible and exciting all at the same time. Yeah, that makes sense. And one that I would add there overall, uh, Jeff, I don't know if you agree, it was just a circle virus vaccine was something that was. Yeah, and I, I guess that's true. There's three silver bullets in this world, in my view. <laughs> the world of pig production. Paline, the, uh, the right circovirus vaccine. Right. Because that was a like a permanent 5% shift in, in uh, uh, number of pigs available to market. Wow. And then, I'm, I'm not saying this because of NutriQuest, but Lipinate. Lipinate, I mean, there are just so few products that work that predictably well. Um, and and there, there's very, you know, that's just the three that I look at and go, well, they are predictably. And, and five days, I think you would agree on that one too. Yeah, but I think that one's intuitively. Once we got past the fact that, the, you know, we always thought that the thing things were going to be digested by the. Yeah, no, I agree. That That's a remarkable product. I agree. I, and I guess another way to put those things that you just said is, hey, you know, when you don't have it, if you don't have paleo, if you don't have phytase, if you don't have serial virus vaccine, you know it, right? Yep. Yeah. Anything else on that arena there or you cover the major advances? Yeah. And, and, and then I had uh, listed the future. What do I think it's headed in the future? Because I don't think yeah. they're uh, separate. I think that... Um, Larry Pope, one of the craziest things I ever heard somebody say was we were talking about in the summertime why these pigs weren't growing and it created bad carcasses. And, and uh, you know, we worked with Mickey Latour at Purdue. And what they found was that in the heat stress, you know, fat, uh, fat cell fill was minimized. I mean, you just wouldn't get it. So you created a very thin, poor quality belly in this example. And what, uh, what Larry Pope said was, well, why don't you just go air condition the barns? And I just thought that was the dumbest thing ever a human being could say. Um, but in retrospect, he's right. Um, he, he, he doesn't know technically why he's right. Uh, technically, it's a real issue. But uh, in all fairness, the only reason we wouldn't air condition barns is because uh, we have to ventilate so much because we have such a horrible waste handling system. Interesting. And if you think about this, I, I, I said air conditioning uh, and integrated factories, the Chinese you know, pig barn, the big tall one factory farm. But honestly, if you looked at the value of the nitrogen that we leave to a farmer, it's worth um, in the order of 18 to 20 dollars per pig space per year. So now you can use amino acids and all that. That gets you to like 18. And so it's a really interesting exercise. That's where all the value is. Like two, three dollars of phosphate. Um, and then if you could gasify that manure, you might get five dollars in energy value. But uh, the the key point is that you look at enclosing this keeping diseases out, keeping, you know, quit hauling pigs up and down roads. If I have to look into the future, I think you're going to see pig production. There's no reason to haul a bunch of finishing pigs around. That's dumb. Spreads disease. Leave them in one spot. Kill them in one spot. Um, recover the waste. I, I think that uh, you, you've got to get to these things. I, China's proven that out. I don't think they're going to be – they're – they, somebody else would have to develop it first, but I don't know. Uh, I think those are, are two things, and I think you look at a 100-micron grind, it's real. And is that a liquid feed delivery system? Maybe. I, I don't think that pelletizing offers some feed sanitation capabilities. That's, so that's the only advantage that pelletizing and a diverse 
and the ability to handle a diverse bolt density. But if you could do liquid feeding and handle, uh, uh, take care of the handling properties of the feed, the only thing left then is feed sanitation. And if you're in one facility, you know, I mean, do you have to have a pellet mill? No. Could it be valuable? Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, that's. But I think you're looking at diets, Marcio, in the 95, uh, 90 to 100 percent of the products that can be digested. So, like your grains, I think you're approaching close to 95 plus percent digestible. Wow. Yeah, that that'll be huge there. Very good. Wow. Yeah, I like this. Super. Uh, those last few points here, Jeff. Very. Uh, yeah, new ideas, right? I like that. Jeff, overall, I appreciate that. Uh, last question here I have um, for the new production nutritionist, any overall word of advice there? Oh, I don't know. I, it's a really uh, fun thing to do. I actually, I, I very much encourage people to go out into production and get that experience and then do something after that. Um, it is uh, a high stress job and uh, that's okay you, you, but you learn a lot and uh, you know jump right in that's my view but that experience is unparalleled get in get it you know get involved with your packer and uh, and be the leader I mean you need to take charge own that entire operation of feed operations from from a personal standpoint, the people don't have to report to you. Uh -huh. You're a servant to all those people. You serve them, right. and you keep that in mind, and they'll they'll love you. Um, you're there to help them and make the enterprise more successful. And if you take that mentality, it'll it'll uh, transform your life, and you'll you'll have fun. You know, make friends with all the people that are involved with execution of your feed program. That's a different mentality. It is yours to own all the way through. And uh, very good. And what, what, what would be a good schedule for, hey, how often to be at, at a feed mill and a farm and office? What, what's the good ratio there for this? I don't know. You, you do need to see what's going on. The problem is the bigger the organization, right. you, know, you're, uh, you need to get out and, and – uh, you need to talk to the people for sure and get out with them. I'd say once a month, you know, you need to be on a farm and, and in a feed mill at a minimum. I, I dealt with a, a huge operation. So, you know, that was hard to do. Um, but, you know, I also dealt with marketing with those animals. And so back to this animal scientist role, you, you need to pick some people that you can have fantastic relationships with and you can get on farms with them and see what's actually going on so that when you're sitting in your office, in your brain, you got a picture of what's going on in that barn while you're thinking about this problem. And, and it's really hard, uh, really big operations. You probably need to see more um, because you just, you'll be shocked by what you see. Back. It's super diverse and super hard. Very good, Jeff. Anything else to wrap up here today? I don't think so. I think we covered a lot of the, the things you and I had kind of set out and uh, hopefully wound a, a full story of, you know, how, how a person kind of comes into their career, what they should think about. Yeah, I love it. And I uh, appreciate it. And I appreciate if anyone that is took all the way to the end, Jeff, we need to congratulate them. This is a new format too, right? Where we decided yep. to go, long without any time restrictions and uh, really have a conversation. So thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you, Marcio. It's always a pleasure. Yeah.